many organizations that sign up to things like Instacart, or DoorDash, Uber Eats, because it's easy. They turn up with a bit of software, put you on their website, job yeah. done. And sometimes the customer actually pays for the, the, the delivery. Then we rush in and we put all our assortment onto there. And the customer comes in and picks up all our low margin items, picks six or seven of them. And we wonder why we don't make any money. Some of the things that we did in good faith during the early stages of the pandemic, because some of the business were closed. So our revenue went from whatever it was to zero very quickly. We didn't act on, on, on developing an e-commerce e- e- platform. So we have to start to think about our proposition mm. in the marketplace and just work back from there. And that will inform us what our supply chain needs to be. Yeah, yeah. How, is, how to, yeah, and, and how to overcome or just realize the, the limits of unit economics. It's, it's a fascinating area. Are you thinking, you say, maybe we should carry safety stock, maybe just in time we got to just in time, or is that just not practical? I'd say the biggest challenge now is, you know, the disruptions now led into how tight commercial and industrial space is, how hot mm. that market is. And it's going, okay, great. I'd like to carry more safety stock. But the commercial and industrial space doesn't exist and or the cost now is very different than it was before. So there's going to be a level of hybridity here. There's going to be just in time, but I think there's going to be, depending on the seasonality of your product, maybe a category of your product that drives a percentage of your business, you're going to have to think about just in case. And you need to do that from a branding perspective. Are you seeing technology that's forward looking or are you seeing technology that is solving yesterday's problem. I think there's still a mix in supply chain, logistics, transportation. I think there's been some slow to adopt technologies. And I think a lot of companies want to find a one size fits all or a comprehensive technology. What we have to think about is, is a lot of what makes our personal day-to-day easier or more enjoyable is multiple. Your bank app is different from your map Mm -hmm. app, different from your social media, different from your entertainment, different from your organization tasks. And I think what's this sort of expectation was a company would find an ERP or transportation management system that would do everything. And I think we've come into the realization, why don't we just use this software for this and this tech product for this? What is stuff I want to spend time on? I don't want to spend time like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Where's my container? I want that fed to me. And there's enough technology in that space from carriers, from other companies to feed that to me. But I have to reorient myself to be able to, to access that. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newbury. I'm a senior executive on call, helping businesses in the make, move, sell flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win, one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, organizations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative, and digital, with thought leaders, experts, and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Retail Matters webinar series. I'm Michelle Rebu, Vice President of Education and Partnerships at Retail Council of Canada. RCC's new retail webinar series is designed to provide the retail community with accessible and quality thought leadership on a variety of topics affecting the retail industry. Each month, we will feature a different topic pertinent to retailers in Canada. Today's session on rethinking roadblocks and supply chain strategy is generously sponsored by CN. At the end of today's presentation, we will take audience questions, so please share them in the chat. To introduce today's session, on behalf of our sponsor, I'd like to welcome Gary Crowther, Director of Yield and Products, Consumer Product Supply Chain, Intermodal Domestic from CN. Please welcome Gary. Thank you, Michelle. 
Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to join you today. Unfortunately, not by screen, but by telephone. CN is proud to be the sponsor of the second webinar of the RCC Retail Matters webinar series. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our many retail customers who are with us today. The panel today is about rethinking your supply chain. At CN, we too are rethinking solutions for our customers. We are leading the way by investing in exciting innovations and technology that create capacity and drive service reliability for our retail customers. Our new guaranteed equipment program provides you with access to priority equipment from CN's large fleet of North American containers. The goal of the program is to better service our customers who have urgent shipments in high demand or constricted markets. And as you all know so well, there is nothing more urgent than consumer demand for retail e-commerce. Plus, CN's Three Coast Network, combined with complete supply chain solutions throughout North America, offers more sustainable shipping options and flexibility to reach your company's sustainability goals. And now to introduce today's speakers. Nearly two years after the great shortage of toilet paper, Canadian retailers continue to face the devastating fallout from the impact of the pandemic, environmental disasters, and more recently, the delays caused by blockades and protests. The continual impact has highlighted the need to rethink how these roadblocks are addressed and how supply chain specialists and retail teams can be prepared, ensuring continuity and seamless customer experiences. Let's welcome today's panel. First off, Gary Newberry, Senior Exec on Call for the Retail Supply Chains and the Last Mile at RetailAid.ca. Luke O'Hare, Director, Logistics and Supply Chain Distribution with Urban Barn. And finally, Audrey Ross, Logistics and Custom Specialist, Orchard Custom Beauty. And our moderator, Michael LeBlanc, Senior Retail Advisor with the Retail Council of Canada and host and president of Maven Media Network. Welcome, everyone. All right, Gary, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm Michael LeBlanc, I'll be your host today. And uh, Gary, no word about joining us from the phone, of course, as the host of podcasts, including the Voice of Retail podcast, I love the spoken word. All right, we got an exciting afternoon planned for us. Exciting is a word that comes up over and over and over again <laughs> in the world of supply chain for good or ill for some of the people out there. And I wanted to start with kind of an interesting question. You can see the bios of the, of the fantastic guests and the experts we have on the panel. So we're not going to get into bios as much because we want to use every minute of time. Again, if you have questions, throw it in uh, the Q&A. If you put them in there, I'll thread them in or and or we'll leave time at the end for a question. So the first question, I'm going to ask Luke this first question. I'm going to ask all our panelists the first question. Listen, there's been a lot of surprises in every given day. You as a profession are used to them. What, if anything, about the past year surprised you? Luke, you go first. Great. If I think back, you know, a year, so let's go back to like February 21, I think of today, I think the biggest surprise is not necessarily one particular element, but going, the stories haven't changed. We haven't really seen any true improvement. The supply chain continues to be an incredible challenge. You could even argue right now, it might actually be more challenging than it was previously. And I think this kind of really speaks to the challenges we have in, you know, rep uh, repairing supply chain, supply network in the future. All right. Audrey, same question to you. What has surprised me? I mean, the, the extent of it, right? You have global supply chains. We work in about 14 different countries. There's no real region that is any different. Everyone's just facing these challenges. I've been asked a bit about, well, what, what was different, you know, maybe in the 2008 financial crisis, you're like, well, that was very sector specific. Whereas when you look at the challenges we're facing now, it's literally from labor to trucking, to ocean carriers, to air cargo, to factories. It's just the extent, right? The sheer you know, amount of what's, what the challenges are. All right, Gary, same question to you. And for the listeners at home, so to speak, uh, this is kind of really the only question I ask all three panelists, but I couldn't help it. So Gary, give us what surprised you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, across the year, and uh, let's sort of think about January 2021 to about now. 
uh, as a board year. I think the most surprising thing is uh, pre the pandemic, we had a few small shocks. We shrugged our shoulders and got on with it. Uh, and to very much what Luke and uh, Audrey has said, that uh, we, we've been living in an age of accumulating disruption. It's one thing on top of another, on top of another. We never have a relief to get over this. And so we started 2021 and uh, we, we all went into the air with some degree of rejoice. And in, in no time flat, a big boat got stuck in a big canal and it <laughs> drove <laughs> my chain went sideways early on this year though. Yeah. and then we, we thought we were over it we, we turned the calendar again and then we had a the Windsor Bridge blockaded you know nobody would have thought about that but we still had to deal with it and it was uh, quite a, a monumental problem to to get around but I think the most important thing I hope everybody has learned is that March 2020 when the first set of restrictions came in we we found the new normal as we look back over two years that was a new normal it started mm -hmm. it's not we're not getting to it at some state we're in it we've right. had it for two years and we need to understand that uh, and recognize it and i think that's a, my big takeaway that i think mm -hmm. many people aren't actually recognizing that we're actually in it and we've been in it for quite some time well accumulated disruption i like that uh, i like that phrase luke let's let's jump into uh, today so give us a sense from your chair and let's say on a scale of one to five, one being sure. normal, five being, you know, crisis level. I don't know what normal looks like to Gary's point anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I don't know if normal is, is in the before time, January 2020 yeah. or whatever normal looks like. As we all know, a career in supply chain always has surprises, whether it's a yeah. pandemic or not. But give us a sense on a scale of one to five, where are you today? Well, I certainly hope I look forward to the utopia of the one of, yeah. you know, being normal. Uh, right now, I'd say, you know, Three and a half, three point five, four. I think, think you know stores are open. Yeah. You know, e-commerce is working. Initiatives that uh, that we scaled quickly are starting to find or have found traction. And, and I think uh, Gary spoke to it uh, really well. Is you know we've kind of adjusted to the new norm mm -hmm. in in some ways, right? Whether it be us as a business or even our customers of like going hey longer lead times, etc. Yeah. There's a little bit of that you know normalization. Uh, so I think. Yeah, right around three, three point five. But I think the biggest thing that is really still driving that, at least from our perspective, is really that international logistics portion. That mm -hmm. continues to be a really significant challenge. That is again driving that number closer to that five or that crisis level than anything else. There's other, as Gary said, accumulated yeah. points, yeah. and Audrey spoke to it. But international logistics is the driving element for us. You know, I had the opportunity last week to to speak with a number of retail leaders is writing the retail conditions report. And some of them said supply chain was getting better. And I had to say, say what? And they, and it wasn't because supply chain is getting better structurally. It's because they're getting better at managing it, yeah. so to speak, whether that's systems or tech. And we're going to get into a lot of that people process and tech later on. Audrey, you find yourself in a role of securing product for retail partners. How much has your day-to-day -day changed when you think about, you know, what you did and what you're doing today? It really is the um, the amount of responses because we went from having a, a fairly consistent routine of, you know, especially on the logistics side, right? You get a booking, you have your vessel you sort of schedule or your air flight schedule. It happens, you know, it lands, it gets delivered and, and so on and so forth. And that is just since last year is just flipped on its head. Everything has to be checked and rechecked, checked and rechecked. Mm. And, you know, we were, we had a bit of a, we've had a gap in technology. So it's like, we're manually and, and reactively checking and recheck everything from, you know, a hot problem project, right? Like we'll have a hot promotion or a store launch, which usually require more attention anyways, but then it's even our inventory that you're like, this should just be, you know, kind of, yeah, it's good to go. And, and then, it, and you're like, where, sorry, where is this? What's happening? Yeah. Um, so that, right. that frequency of follow-up and we've lost on the, on the vendor side, they're so overwhelmed, overworked and busy that no one's proactively letting you know, because the sheer volume of everything that has to be checked, it's just impossible to get that, that update. Right. Right. And, and for us, the shift is I can't get you a good price. I can't get you a good time, but I can tell you what's happening. And so my communication level mm -hmm. is now with senior management. I didn't used to talk to them 
you know, maybe I talk to them, you know, sort of weekly or strategically. And now it's, I mean, it's just constant. And then I'm, I'm now looped into direct calls, like with our, you know, retail partners, like customer facing that I did a little bit on problem projects, but now it's, you know, sort of almost every project. And so that communication level, I have to be able to talk with senior management, with, with retailers, with, with everyone while managing the day-to-day of, of what's happening. So that's been a, a real transition. Now on those calls with your retail partners, uh, how have you seen retailers kind of back to what Luke has been saying about adjusting and moving? Um, how have you seen them adjust things? I remember you and I chatted a while ago about, yeah. you know, generally a retailer would take, let's say eight weeks to make a decision because they'd kind of get it in front of customers and marketing and decide on packaging is, you know, there, there's maybe opportunity. Have you see, how have you seen retailers practically try to just, you know, collapse whatever they can do to collapse a timeline? everyone's shifting up. So, I mean, we used to have a fairly, you know, speed to market was always like the goal, right? How fast can you get this turned around? But then internally, of course, you have to put together your artwork. We do a lot of custom personalized products. So the time is a little bit longer, but we've seen our retailers amp up, right? So like holiday discussions have started a little bit earlier, starting sort of this year. Um, You know, anything that's promotional or or high value that they're doing, it's like it's in talks earlier. Um, and we're getting the push for, you know, the artwork check, the, the product verifications, the approvals seemingly a little bit earlier um, in order to try and compensate for these, these extended timelines. But even then, it's, you know, we still are running into, I was talking to a coworker this morning, he's just, the, you know, she's like, I just seem to be giving bad news because now there's another, there's an outbreak in a region where we have a factory about the virus. And it's, you know, like, they, they did everything right. We had the yeah, artwork, yeah. we had this early, we had the product, the purchase, everything was right. And now we're just unexpectedly, the manufacturing is delayed. So, mm. so I mean, our retailers are adjusting. I don't think anybody wanted to, and I think we all want to get back to a speed to market, but mm. people have an acceptance level that I think coming into 2022 that we maybe didn't have last year. And perhaps some agility and adaptation uh, mm-hmm. always present, but maybe, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a little more, a little more agile. Gary, uh, when you are approached and when you talk to your clients, how are you on a day-to-day basis? Because uh, I know you also you work day-to-day, but you also work very long time structurally. How are you helping them navigate these choppy waters or closed bridges or whatever as, as you take your calls from your clients? Um, many of the projects I'm approached have a, don't tend to have a strategic, sen- what I call a strategic sentiment, like, uh, mm-hmm. oh, let, let's let's get a platform for 2025 or let, let's up uh, ourselves for an aggressive growth rate that might or might not uh, materialize or uh, let's have a three-year roadmap. However, underneath this is a constant, and I'd call it a harmonious refrain of, mm. let's have some quick wins. But we can <laughs> <implement."> <laughs> and it's like, I'll oh, just hold the bus because while we're, I mean, for the last two years, we've been doing micro versions of quick wins mm. and to, to get somebody from outside to understand and then work out what the quick wins are. I, I, I want to help the clients to actually think more structurally, more, more longer term, because we can spend a lot of time on that and actually not progress the business mm. very well. Mm. So I, I tend to try to elevate the conversation back to the longer term that's often the, the starting point in the conversation. Right. It, it's very uh, challenging for boards and, uh, and business leaders when I'm talking about the big picture and where we need to get to, when actually, if they open the door, the fire's out there. Right. And it's literally just, just right. the other side of that door and they know they've got to get the we orders need, out. We need a fireman, not a fire protection system because yeah. you know, everything's that's, on, on that's fire. It, what I would say is if we, if we just t- take a couple of steps back and think about who, who've been the beneficiaries of the last two years, and we think about, you know, the large companies like Walmart, uh, Amazon, maybe Loblaws, and, you know, the very large organizations that had resource to, uh, and financial strength to, to kind of plow our way through some things. If we think about Amazon is that uh, I, I would ask people not to be like Amazon, but just to think like Amazon. They're always thinking years out. And they think about the categories they're going to be in in years' time. They're not focused on, they clearly are focused on, but they're not talking about rushing this order through because Mrs. Jones wants that order today. So if we can just change that perspective, we stand a good chance of uh, getting to a better place. I want to structure uh, the balance of the rest of the conversation onto, uh, we talked about off mic and pre-call about how we structure such a broad remit, so to speak, for ourselves. And we decided kind of landed on a people process 
and technology spot. So I'm going to start with people. And Audrey, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned something in, when you were last speaking about, you know, someone who works for you, it's got to pick up the call. And every time they're picking up the phone to a client, it's not great news. So yeah. Talk about the challenges that you face on a day-to-day -day basis in your leadership role. Yeah, I mean, it's been, I think, throughout the last two years, you know, everyone at the beginning of this, it, there was the uncertainty. And so everyone was just, and working from home. And so everybody was really right. just amped up their, their efforts, right? Like everybody was like, well, we don't want to have canceled orders. What can we do? Very, you know, so we've all been sort of on. And I think through last year as well, I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I did over the last eight months and, and it's exhausting. You're trying to keep team members like engaged and encouraged and, and it's like, it's, you know, trying to reflect, like, it's not just our company, like everyone is going through this, right? Like, you know, it's, it's trying, but then it is trying to assess, is it because we're lacking in some sort of organizational piece or a process piece, you know, but you don't even really have time to think of that because, you know, like you say, the fire's on the other side of the door. That has been the, the hardest challenge is trying to keep people motivated in their work, even though it is sort of this consistent, you know, everyone wants to have a great performance and do really well. And we're accustomed to, you know, we've had some award-winning products. We do some interesting innovations. We work with some fantastic customers and it's just, it's, it can be very demotivating yeah. to have to have these conversations with these wonderful retailers who we work with that it's like, here's another project that we think is off track. And, and we know you really wanted this for your timeline, but now it's off track again. And, and that's been the challenge is just sort of keeping the, the, you know, motivation up and just, and just really connecting and, and having compassion, you know, and, and because there are other things for people too, where, where you're dealing with your day-to-day -day and personal life and, and, yeah. you know, the work from home and the flexibility um, is nice, but it's also different. And so there's a lot of things around, you know, sort of engagement and, and culture to, to focus on as well. Uh, Luke, how are you helping your team and, in fact, the broader urban barn leadership team get through all this? I mean, when you, you know, from a communications perspective, I know I speak to merchants who their buyers used to spend 10% of their time in the logistics of their order because they had expertise and experts in the organization who would take it from there, kind of pass the baton. But now everybody's in that game. So talk about how you're managing conversations, both, I guess, within your team and then up to management because again perhaps on a an ongoing basis there's not great news coming out from the supply chain yeah uh, absolutely we're definitely the bearers of bad news there's no doubt about that <laughs> I, I think uh, yeah there's never been a time where uh our communications being more cross-functional audrey kind of spoke to it as a per example is i can't think of a time until you know recently where you have a conversation with marketing around going hey there's going to be delays on product how, and we, we need to go speed to market. So what do we need to do proactively from whether it be, you know, creating, you know, uh, promotional uh, tools as, a, as an example. So I think there's more cross-functional and there, those teams are looking for that from us now because right. they're going, okay, your disruption is causing disruption from myself. How can I level set? But a whole, also, how do I provide that context and share it with my team so they understand what's happening in the greater greater elements. Or if you think about it from an omni-channel perspective now, it's, okay, great. We have a we have a message in our brick and mortar stores. Do we have the exact same message on our website? Do we have the exact same message that's got, right. that's going down uh, to our customers through our, you know, channels, whether it be social channels or whether it be through, you know, an order tracking platform, you know, there's all these channels now that you need to make sure the messages are aligned. Mm -hmm. And there's different people in charge of each of those channels. So you really need to, you know, share that. And then of course you've got the external, like, you know, your, your end cons customer, you know, this is a, a really right. significant challenge of great. They're consuming in all those channels and how do you make sure that they consume it the way they want? Cause the other challenge is if you don't, they're going to revert back to you and all of a sudden your call centers are overwhelmed right. and you know, that creates a new challenge. Right. And then all of a sudden yeah. that conversation looks very different. I think probably the greatest alignment, un unsurprisingly, is really with obviously your purchasing and planning team. Demand planning, you know, be careful of bottlenecks. Mm. Try to flatten out your demand. Uh, I think, you know, uh, Gary is noting it as well. The system does not have elasticity. There's none. It's gone. 
Mm. You know, it, it does not exist. So if, if there's a peak, you know, the valley doesn't necessarily exist afterwards. Almost this wake mm. continues of disruption. <laughs> it's almost yeah. like, you know, the, it just exacerbates this bullwhip yeah. effect. And all of a sudden it's like that ball neck creates an even bigger challenge. And then Audrey spoke to it as, you know, really again with your purchasing team is um, because of the disruption of our partners, your vendors, your manufacturers, you got to follow up and touch base with them in regularly. Is your production cycle on time? Is it going to land on time? What disruption are you going through? Because they're having troubles with labor or sure. they can't get the inputs. So they're having the same challenges with yeah, logistics, yeah. Yeah. you know, that we're having with an end product. So those are really kind of like the key touch points that I'm finding internally and finding at least a level of success. I, I like that, uh, that bullwhip kind of uh, what Gary called it, that accumulated disruption, right? Yeah. Just like a wave, almost like a snowplow, a little bit of here and a little yep. bit there and just kind of keeps piling up. Gary, back to you. When you think, and again, talk to your clients about people and the people part, what, what's your advice for supply chain leaders and people of the future? What, what are the skills and, and how do you advise that they should be looking to build the team that can handle the agility that's no doubt going to be needed now and in the future? The world of work has uh, been fundamentally changing and it, it hasn't finished yet. It's uh, still a long way to go. Uh, but what we know from the last two years is many supply chain folk have found a way in, in, in some kind of legendary status that they've been finally recognized. Uh, they've been very good at solving things in real time, overcoming what now seem to be immense challenges. But they were doing it behind the scenes for the last two years. Uh, they're typically numerous. They, they tend to be strong team leaders uh, and motivating and, and de developed themselves quite considerable stamina over the last two years. Mm. Otherwise, they've dropped dead, frankly, the, the, the pace that they have to work at now. But I believe there are a number of key areas that leadership, uh, leaderships of a supply chain need to be looking for. People moving up the ranks and for their own skill base. And the first one is strategic thinking. You need to think your way through these problems. You can't just, just keep plowing on and doing what you did over the last two years and probably prior to that. So we have to imagine thinking the un unthinkable as a, as a way of seeing through a problem. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking and problem solving, uh, it's said very calmly, being able to really have your wits about you when you're facing an issue, being able to pick that way through it that makes sense both uh, for now, but also for, for the longer term. Uh, being terrific, and I think that um, uh, Luke mentioned about this ability to communicate mm. sometimes challenging issues that you have in the supply chain to colleagues who don't really understand it and don't use the same language. But that doesn't just stop that way. It's a two-way street. And also it's, a, it's within the team as well. Sometimes a, we, we move up the organisation, we start to adopt certain languaging skills but we still need to be able to get down on the warehouse floor or go into a transport mm. office and, and chat to people in ways that they can understand. And, and that ability to you know, be multi-layer in our communication skills is incredibly important. Mm. Uh, high levels of collaboration. We, we, we say collaboration and we, we think we know what it means, but more often than not, you know, uh, it often means kind of beating up the supply and we collaborate <laughs> why win and they lose. But it, if we can learn how to collaborate Mm -hmm. Because our, our retail world is, is a series of, we can call them business units, but we actually, we, we tend to call them silos. And we have these friction points, uh, which have been long established in the, during the pandemic, they became a bit more fluid, but we still need to find ways of collaborating on our mission critical problems and actually all working together to try and uh, beat this into submission. Uh, a couple of more being able to identify risks, risks, didn't really feature up until the pandemic and all of a sudden they all burst out onto the table and we found out very quickly these very long supply pipelines became high risk uh, endeavours. Um, being empathetic, regardless of what the challenges are, we still got to relate to our colleagues in a way that we understand the problems they're facing, although we're in the supply chain and we've got our own hands yeah. full. And the most important thing, and lastly, is maintaining a sense of humour and a winning mindset. Because if you can just pick your way through this with a smile on your face, you're going to get to a much better place with your, your team members and your colleagues across the business. Right on. Uh, great advice. Great advice. So, Gary, I'm going to stick with you because I want to move to process now. 
you've been very vocal in many forms about what needs to change around supply chains. And, you know, it's probably beyond the remit of today to have this long, big restructuring discussion. But in the in the time we have a short, medium and long term adaptations, what, do, what are you seeing and what is your advice around what needs to change from uh, what used to do, what supply chain professionals did before, and what they need to do moving forward? Mm. There's a great article, it just gone live, uh, I wrote an article about supply network redesigning. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see, uh, and if you go to supplypro.ca, they have a sort of monthly online mag, go into that and dial up pages 16 and 17, you'll see me there. It's all about retail supply chain and particularly the supply network side. But um, fundamentally, what we've been, uh, the, the structure of supply chain networks we have were probably born in the 80s, 90s, when uh, retailers felt that they needed to find alternative sources of product much cheaper to keep, keep themselves in the game. Uh, and so that's led to uh, these very extended geographical supply chains. What we need to be doing is actually rethinking these. And many organizations have started to multi-source, so they may be even been fortunate enough to bring some stuff back on back mm -hmm. on the shore you know, inside Canada or at least spread it around North America so it's near shore or or found alternative sources maybe in Italy rather than you know China for instance so we've got that and if you read the article you'll see that that's step two so the first one is recognizing that we've got a problem the second one is doing something about it mm -hmm. so multi-sourcing is is one of that one one of ten steps but they stop there and I'd encourage anybody to go beyond that, read the article and go beyond that, right. which is starting to form those collaborative relationships. Now give us that, give us that uh, article URL again, the uh, supply chain. It, it's supplypro.ca. Supplypro.ca. It's a, a kind of online magazine called Supply Professional. It's, uh, I've never featured myself in that because I'm yeah. at the other end of the, the pipeline <laughs> as such, but they asked me, so there you go. they got it. All right. Uh, but there's a number of steps and it's all about this developing collaborative relationships in a different way than normal and every time i bring this subject up i talk about being price and different and getting all your suppliers mm. for a particular category or product line in the room together and say here's my demand how are we going to fix this uh, because we can't live on on the basis of doing a forecast for two or three seasons out and then handing that to one concentrated supplier, which tends to be typically in China, mm -hmm. alongside our other competitors who are in there as well. So we're in a kind of pecking order. We've got a good price, but my goodness, uh, all the disruptions around there. But mm -hmm. it, you can go at the other end, you know, the last mile. You, you find that many organizations have signed up to things like Instacart, or DoorDash, Uber Eats and stuff like that. Because it's easy, it's easy to get into that. They turn up with a bit of software, put you on their website, job yeah. done. And sometimes the customer actually pays for the logistics side, of the delivery. So it's mm. nothing to do with us. Then we rush in and we put all our assortment onto there. And the customer comes in and picks up all our low margin items, picks six or seven of them, and we wonder why we don't make any money. So some of the things that we we did in in good faith during the early stages of the pandemic because some of our businesses were closed so our revenue went from whatever it was to zero very quickly if we didn't act on on, on developing an e-commerce e e platform so we have to start to think about our proposition mm. in the marketplace and just work back from there and that will inform us what our structure our supply chain needs to be and I think the more I read on LinkedIn about like rapid grocery delivery, which is going to stir up a lot of things, you know, 15 minutes and you get your order on your doors. Yeah. Yeah. How, how to, yeah and, and how to create that, uh, you know, how to overcome or just realize the, the limits of unit economics. It's, it's a fascinating area. Audrey, I wanted to throw to you about changes. And um, I talked to a lot of leaders who have made changes to adapt to the unusual circumstances of the COVID era. And we're all trying now, I think, and my question to you is what of the changes you've made and how you work in the processes that you have that you think are gonna stick? In other words, these things, hey, they were either a necessary or a very positive change that we made in the process of how we do business that will continue post COVID. I think we expanded our network. We were working with a couple of core vendors and we're still working with them. Um, but at least on the logistics and transportation side, 
Um, we've certainly had to reach out to sort of larger and, and, and a more extensive network to be able to address some of the reaction problems that we're having. Um, and I don't know that that's a bad situation to be in. And, and I think what Gary is speaking to the collaboration, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of us were moving things and I'm not, I'm, a, I'm probably a smaller shipper than Luke is over at Urban Barn. Like we're, we're mid sort of small to mid size shipper and we're, we're not Walmart size at all. Um, and so making this, this expanded network, we were all shipping everything individually and we're relying on the sort of established freight forwarder networks or carrier networks. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here for, for our freight forwarders, for, for sort of people in that space to really collaborate a little bit more with your customers. Because if I'm sort of fighting for space alongside my customers, my retail partners, alongside other vendors, um, then we're all just competing and, and getting stuck with higher prices, lack of space, lack of capacity. And there still hasn't been a real way to break down, as, as Gary said, these silos and, and our business units to think, what if I collaborate so that I can get a bit bigger with someone who maybe isn't my direct competitor, but maybe is in, in a very similar space or with my own retail partners, because they move stuff with other vendors. They, you know, we don't exclusively just move stuff with us. What would that look like? And I think that was, you know, 10 years ago, you would never talk about who you were shipping with, who, what factory you were using. <laughs> right. Like that was like, yeah. you'd be, you know, 15 years ago, you're whiting out that fact so no one finds out what's, <laughs> who's who, right? And I think that has just, you know, I think with the new sort of business environment, that has just kind of gone out the window. And I'm not sad to see it go um, because really it does give you an opportunity when we start to think, you know, right now we're in reaction, but what is sustainable? Right. What is going to help us if we think we're heading into some climate crisis and emergency? Are we being sustainable when we're each trying to move something with all these individual costs and carbon costs and, and waste instead of just sharing and collaborating a little bit more? So I, I think that's, I'm, I'm quite excited to see if we can keep expanding that sharing and visibility and lack of like competitive, oh no, I have to move this by myself independently from everybody else. Um, and just really, really open up what collaboration means. That's fantastic. Luke, let's talk about strategic sourcing and what you can and are willing or what the industry is willing to do differently. You can make different decisions. Gary talked about, you know, trying to near source. That means selecting different vendors. Sometimes that means different products, different value equations. Um, are you thinking, and is it a, a world of possibility where you say, maybe we should carry safety stock, maybe just in time we got to just in time. Uh, or is that just not practical? Is is you know, in in a short in a short question is from a strategic sourcing perspective, in your processes, what what is in the realm of possibility, and what are you looking at? So thinking of just in time and really how most of us really worked really under that framework, I, I'd say the biggest challenge now is you know the disruptions now led into how tight commercial and industrial space is, how hot mm. that market is. And it's going, okay, great. I'd like to carry more safety stock. I'd like to have <clears throat> backup, so to speak. But the commercial and industrial space doesn't exist and or the cost now is very different than it was before. So I, I think that there's probably, there's going to be a level of hybridity here. There's going to be just in time, but I think there's going to be, uh, depending on, you know, the seasonality of your product, maybe a category of your product that, you know, drives a percentage of your business, you're going to have to think about just in case. What does that just That's in case look just like? Just in case, yeah. And I, I think, you know, you're not going to be able to apply that across all your, your, your breadth of your product, but maybe you're going to apply it to certain categories, or maybe even you're going to go lower to like, you know, a select amount of SKUs that just have that impact to your business, or there's a customer expectation attached to those. And you need to do that from a, you know, maybe from a branding perspective. So I, th I think you're going to see that hybridity. I think the other thing that, you know, we've learned and I've talked a little bit about is, you know, forecasting and this, this, it's, it's so disrupted. Forecasting <laughs> is, you know, you say forecasting, but, you know, are you really forecasting? Or are you <laughs> you're just trying to get as close to that bullseye as possible? Right. But I think what we've really learned is international logistics is not built for peaks. 
Like it just is not. Right. So there's not a lot of f- not a lot of what someone described as burst capacity, right? It's built you got it. tight as it's gonna be to you got achieve it. what absolutely it achieves, right? Mm. Yeah. So how do you flatten that out? And I don't think it's necessarily flatting it out like you know, you need to bring your product and you need to bring in, but are there complementary categories mm. that can maybe, you know, instead of a bit of a peak here and a bit of a little here, can you bring them tighter together? And that smooths things out. And Audrey is kind of speaking to it in that case is, you know, does that help you with capacity? Does it allow you to mm. get that container that then, okay, great. I can mix ship it and get it onto a vessel. And while there's challenges there, at least now it's en route to me. So I think that. Uh, those two levels of hybridity, mm. I think people will really start incorporating. And if, you, if you're not already, really need to start thinking about. Very good. Audrey, I'm going to kick off the technology conversation again for the listeners who kind of do people, mm. process, and technology. I wanted to kick it off with you. Are you seeing technology solutions? You mentioned very early on in your comments how you may or may not have had the right tech stack going into the COVID crisis. Perhaps you're looking. Are you seeing technology that's forward-looking, or are you seeing technology that is solving yesterday's problem, pre-COVID problem, the before time mm-hmm. problem? I think there's still a mix. I think I think overall, as a supply chain in supply chain logistics transportation, I think there's been some slow to adopt technologies, and I think a lot of um, companies similar to to what we do at Orchard or, or some of our smaller retailers, maybe wants to find a one size fits all or a or a comprehensive technology one what we have to think about is is a lot of what makes our personal day to day easier or more enjoyable is multiple you know your bank app is different from your direction map mm-hmm. app different yeah. from your social media different from your entertainment different from your organization task and i think what's this sort of expectation was a company would find an erp or a transportation management system that would do everything and I think we've come into the realization through the pandemic, if we didn't have something, it's like, why don't we just use this software for this and this tech product for this? And there's a whole other company that will connect them for you so you can have the communication piece. Um, but, but I think we've really realized when you're looking at some of the gaps, especially when we have, we've had labor issues, labor changes, shortages, Right. What is stuff I want to spend time on? I don't want to spend time to, like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Where's my container? I want, I want that fed to me. And there's enough technology in that space from carriers, from, from other companies to feed that to me. But I have to reorient myself to be able to, to access that. And the other piece of it is, is, is there technology, you know, if you're in e-commerce or, or that kind of customer facing is there technology? It's it's two parts. What technology is making your customer relationship better, stronger, um, you know, and, and more making them choose you? And then internally, right? What is the technology you're using internally to help your teams be faster and, and, and more efficient? We've moved past that we're going to find an ERP system that's going to solve everything to, okay, if I have sort of three segments of I've got customer facing, I've got vendor facing, and I've got internal what are the smaller tools that I can adopt? Because mm-hmm. they're quick wins, some of them, right? Mm-hmm. Like we switched from using, you know, there's the joke in, in supply chain and, and sort of my sphere of like, are you still using an Excel spreadsheet to organize yourself, right? Like I've, yeah. I've seen, you know, I heard a warehouse is doing manila folders and post-its still. And you're like, guys, <laughs> get an iPad. There's a lot going on in tech for sure. And it's just trying to find something small that you can adopt because you can start running it quickly, just like how we all started using banking apps and social media apps that you can just start in your day-to-day quick, quick, and then and then maybe look to what's a, what's a larger opportunity or a more strategic mm-hmm. opportunity. Well, Luke, I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to give you a magic wand. There it is. There's your mm-hmm. magic wand. Beautiful. Uh, Love it. And with this magic wand, what would you spend? And imagine it goes into place smoothly. You could have it tomorrow. Of course. What would you spend your last budget dollar on to improve your supply chain with this? Great. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat just a touch and go, I would love something that gave great visibility. However, speaking to uh, what Audrey said earlier, how does visibility help you if you're, you know, your manufacturing shut down? Great. It's good to know that, but it doesn't really help you per se. Right. I think using the lens as a, a, a retailer that has a, you know, a strong brick and mortar sense, and then obviously you know, has e-commerce as a, a, a much larger part of their business, you know, especially over the last couple of years. And then using the lens that uh, 
Gary's been speaking about, but, but forward thinking. I think you really, uh, if you've got that sort of framework, you really need to start thinking about omni-channel fulfillment. You know, mm-hmm. product's going to be slow. Um, it's disrupted. Once you have it in your business, how do you get as fast to the customer so you can uh, make up for any of that time that you've lost? Or mm-hmm. once you get it, great. The customer's been upset with the lead time, but once it's say, hey, you own it, you can surprise and delight with a really quick fulfillment. And, you know, uh, we've talked about how inventory is so precious. Well, how do you leverage that inventory? If, you know, you have stores, you know, you've got basically each of those are a fulfillment site one way or another, Mm. regardless of channel. So I think, you know, those would be, you know, let's take visibility out of the the equation. I think omni-channel fulfillment is something that you really need to think about today also will pay dividends in the future. Gary, you've no doubt been watching the the tech vendor side of supply chain for your entire career. As you look at, uh, you know, I imagine there's some very, very bright people on the tech side coming up with solutions to problems that Luke and Audrey have every day. Have you seen what's the next best supply chain mousetrap? Do you have any sense of what's coming or what's in the, under development that you could share with us? No, the, uh, I see a lot of whatever the brand name is with AI on the end of it, as if that's ah, yeah. it. And AI will kind of magically deal with everything. And I think that uh, what I found out from the small endeavor I have on the side is that it's actually specifying the problem is a key thing here. Sure. So the AI just hopefully will just help you make much more informed decisions uh, much quicker than they, they've previously done on say things like spreadsheets. I, I still go to clients and they're, they tell me the, the processes and it joined up by spreadsheets. It's like, which century are we in? <laughs> <laughs> it's scary. But I, I'd say this yeah. though, um, to, to sort of a blend of what Audrey and um, Luke have said, suggested about how to apply this. Uh, and reflecting on a point I made earlier, which is that if you apply technology on the as is, without going back to your proposition, what you're trying to do in the market, if we, we're trying to get to. Mm. If you just go, well, I need a warehouse management system, right. push it in, job done. It may actually end up being a real pair of handcuffs because mm-hmm. this is a moved on or is moving on. And you've got this sort of configuration that you, you now either have to uplift or spend a lot of time and energy trying to reconfigure it. I'd say also that when you're looking at specifying requirements, I, I'd encourage anybody during this time, given the, the amount of disruption, and we don't know what's happening tomorrow, really. We used to, <laughs> it used to be like more of the same, but uh, to be adventurous and be quite bold in our thinking, uh, to, to try and think about what might happen and how to future proof against that before we start rushing out and uh, buying tech. And then, you know, once we've organized our process, then we introduce a tech that that matches our uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is, if you're using something which is basically off the shelf, and I'd encourage us to intensively configure that, but not to add things into it, like customization. So not configure, not customize, right? Basically is what you're advocating for. Because your competitor is likely to be using the same software and you're going to look like them. Mm. So you have to find ways of looking at your process, trying to innovate it in some way, and then intensively configuring the standard package to do what you want to do. So that would be my thoughts on tech, but yeah. there's always a new uh, order management system, which I think Luke was alluding to, is finding a way that orders can be handled across your network and yep. it finds an optimum path between the distance between where the stock is and the customer is with some rate structures and where that stock can be pulled in one go uh, and that's the essence of an order management system but often I've seen them implemented with a policy in it which stops that kind of AI approach at sort of variable th- searching through what's the best configuration yeah. here and so we, we sometimes find tech is implemented to fix this problem rather than to try and find a way to the future. Well I, I work with a fantastic uh, CIO Gary Davenport at Hudson's Bay and uh, Gary I'll, I would always say let's not buy a legacy system 
<laughs> in other <laughs> words, let's let's buy a system for the future, not for solving the problems that uh, that we have today. All right, so we got ten minutes left, a little a uh, little under ten minutes left. So I encourage everyone uh, listening, if you've got any questions, throw them in uh, the uh, the Q and A. You all know this uh, this format. Throw those in the Q and A. I've got, I'm going to start uh, with the same question to all three panelists. All right. So advice for the retailers listening. Two starts, one stop, based on what you've learned in the COVID era and what you expect for the year ahead in retail. Luke, I'm going to start with you. Two starts, one stop. So as they say, you know, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Your, your <laughs> forecast and your, your vendors in some way are your best friends, but your worst enemies, you know, we're going to go through a macro environmental change here as there's, you know, we went from uh, this, you know, huge spend into goods. There's going to be a shift from goods to services. That's going to happen. We've probably, many of us have had good business. You want to uh, be really close there, be able to pivot. So you don't end up being stuck with stock. And all of a sudden you're in a whole new world of challenges. Mm. That'd be the one start. I'd say stay really close to that. Number two is communing, collaborate, more and more and more internally. This will only help your end customer and it's gonna drive a clearer message to your end customer. They're the ones that pay the bills. I, I think the more you do internally, the better it's gonna help with your external message. And uh, I had it down here, but I'm, Gary's been reinforcing it. I, I couldn't agree more thinking, okay, we just gotta wait for this to be over. It's not over. We're in it. This is the next normal. <laughs> there might be another next normal, yeah. but we're in the next normal. It's not that it's over. It's in the next normal. This may not be the final moment. Uh, and, you know, again, there might be a wave of another normal, yeah. uh, but we're firmly entrenched in it. And stop thinking about that because you're in it and you need to start acting. I mean, listen, today's day, today's events, right? You never know when war would break yeah. out in Europe. Uh, what exactly. hasn't in 80 years and we have it today. So, um Expect the unexpected. Gary, same question, two starts, one stop. My first start is uh, to, if you're not already doing it, uh, do try and find that mental capacity to think strategically. And, that, and I'm using mm -hmm. my language very carefully. So I, I hear so many conversations saying, what well, strategize the orders out today? That's not a strategy. That's barely tactics. That's operational. <laughs> That's what we should be doing just naturally. And you've got people who sort of pull over that so you can actually take take the level up to tactics, which is maybe a time scale of the next few months to the strategic, which is the next few years. When you start thinking strategically, make sure you take people with you, your, 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 your colleagues, your, maybe your, your, your business mm -hmm. leaders. Don't assume that they actually understand the supply chain. I know we've had two years where mm -hmm. it's the most important thing ever. Yeah. And they, they kind of say, yeah, we understand it. But they may not. And, and being able to explain that very carefully, the journey you want to take the business on from a supply chain point of view is very important. The second one is that if you're doing this, great, but if you're not doing it, uh, fully engage your teams and, and, and colleagues in ideation. You can't have all the answers. You're not seeing the whole business every day in all its uh, splendor. So do that to get innovation, innovative thinking coming through from from people in the warehouse and transport fleet and inventory and merchandise, just try and blend all that together to get that innovation. And more importantly, to get that energetic endeavor going on. Because sometimes just asking people, have you got any ideas? I'm like in a bit of a fix here. How do we navigate through this? What's your ideas? They go, oh, boss. And they come up with it. And mm -hmm. suddenly they feel like, yeah. you know, the boss is listening, which is great. Win win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Fantastic. The big stop is um, if your life over the last two years have got like one massive firefight, um, you must stop that. And, uh, you know, you must check in, on your own definition of insanity. If you're just going in now and it feels <laughs> more stressful, more, more sort of demanding, yeah. you, know, you just can't get beyond it. You really need to, to, to stop that and actually think, do I really want to carry on firefighting for the next two years? And actually step back and say, how do I... What, what is causing this and how do I unravel this mm. so that I can actually move these on to a kind of medium term plan rather than just the every, th every day I have to fix all these problems and the same wretched problems. So I, I would encourage anyone to, to be, fault, be bold in your thinking and, and not reactive. And that's an important point that the 
supply chain is full of influences which could drag you into detail. It's so right. important to kind of keep above that, especially if you're a leader, to make sure that you can actually see where the path forward is and pick your way through that. Audrey, we've got a question from the audience. I'm going to throw it to you. Last words to you. Okay. Um, so how can we create contingency alternative growth areas to manage supply chain issues, new markets, education to your customers, your clients? Are you thinking about that kind of in parallel? In other words, we've got problems to solve, but how do we kind of start at the same time growing our markets and thinking about alternatives with the business? For sure. I think that reflects, you know, sort of what Gary and Luke sort of were offering in their starts and stops. It's that thinking creatively, right? Rethinking your supply chain, right? Because we've all sort of followed a model of just in time where we've all been following other people's models and really understanding what your product is, where you're getting it from and where the best sources are, and then having multi-sources for that to help mitigate the risks of it. There's definitely new markets and new there's companies everywhere who quite possibly make, you know, there's lots of companies who make cosmetics. They're all over the globe and it's finding them and starting the, the communication and building that partnership process. And, and it is long-term. So, so this, this idea that we've all been in this reaction mode and dealing with what we've got on our plate, as Gary and Luke emphasized, like take that, you've got to find either some body or a portion of your day-to-day -day to start thinking really in. creatively, yeah. really innovatively on, on your structures, your processes, whatnot. And just, you know, if it's an, if it's three hours a week, trying to, to be very expansive. Mm. And like we've said, not solving the old problem, what's coming next and how can you be the leader and being the leader, you know, for, for us means how are we, how are we managing our business to business relationships and, and willing with the customer? If you're direct to customer, what does the customer want? What do they want in two years? What would you want? Yeah. Um, and just being really creative and, and bold and then heading for that mark. Well, it's great advice. I can't think of a better way to end our time together. And thank you all for such a great discussion. Thanks to CN and Gary for sponsoring and, and presenting. Michelle, back to you. Yes, thanks everyone. Gary, Luke, Audrey, and Michael, we really appreciate you sharing all of your insights today. Thank you to our attendees for joining us and of course for C to CN for making this possible. The supply chain conversation continues this year at the RCC Store Conference. Store will be hosted in person May 31st and June 1st at the Toronto Congress Centre. Thank you again to CN for their support today and to all of our speakers and to you for attending. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your team. You can connect with me via the website retail.ca and go to the contact page or via LinkedIn by typing linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash last dash mile. Look forward to hearing from you and playing an active part with your supply chain and your business's transformation as you start to act boldly, think big, scale, adapt and win.